three weeks of this program, so I'd like to thank them. It was very nice. And also to give me an opportunity to talk about uh, my research. But I have to be brief, so let's start by what's the question that interests me more generally. Is it possible to construct a theory of quantum matter in classical space-time without running into conceptual problem? Let's say I, I like to entertain the possibility that gravity is fundamentally semi-classical. Of course, it's a hard question. I mean, an easier but doable is, is it possible in the non-relativistic limit at least, okay? Let's say I, I go to the Newtonian realm and then I try to see if it's possible. I think Lajos has already advocated for that and probably also André Grossard. So I hope at, the, at that point you are convinced that this is also interesting, although maybe it's less, less than the previous talk. Uh, so, Classical gravity, you, you clearly have two different facets. Okay? The first one is you have space-time that modifies the dynamics of matter, and then you have matter that curves space-time. So the two uh, back react on each other. When you want to make uh, semi-classical gravity, you have a curved space-time that modifies the dynamics of quantum matter. Okay? I'm being extremely sketchy here. And to be brief, this is not much of a problem, okay? At least it's a very difficult technical problem, but I mean, conceptually, we think we understand what's happening. The difficulty, of course, is to source space-time curvature from quantum matter. This part is difficult, and this part we don't know. So now that matter is fuzzy, I have operators on this side and scalars, I mean, numbers on this side. So, I mean, we, we don't really know what to do, okay? And, so the, the old choice, the old answer to this problem uh, was done by uh, Christian Moller and Leon Rosenfeld, and you just take the expectation value, okay? That's the cheap way to do it. I'd, I'd like to insist that it's really a choice, okay? You have no natural prescription for doing that. Then, I mean, it's also quite weird because uh, Leon Rosenfeld was himself, like, really um, uh, a strong uh, Kervan Copenhagen orthodox, and it's not so natural to do that if you don't think there is some reality in the state. So, I mean, this is something André has been explaining in detail uh, the previous week, but this in the non-relativistic limit for one, for say a one particle wave function, essentially means that you, you source the gravitational field with psi square. And as we, as he, as he also showed, this gives the Schrodinger-Newton equation, which is a nonlinear extension of the Schrodinger-Newton equation, of the Schrodinger equation, sorry. Yeah. You mean what state? This? Yeah, this is, this is a sketchy way to say, like you take the average value with respect to whatever matter you have. Like the, this is matter field. And then I know this, you have a lot of trouble. Do you take it on backward like cone or stuff like that? I don't really want to uh, enter into that. Let, let's say you put a foliation. Uh, but I mean, I mean, if you want to start from there, this is pretty clear, okay? We have less ambiguities in the formulation. Um, I, I just wanted to be a bit fancy, but I shouldn't have. Um, what I would like to say that as simple as Schrodinger-Newton seems, it's not so trivial, okay? You have, you have many subtleties. The first one is not a solution. It's what you would intuitively have. Like, if you have a wave function of a single particle with two blobs, they attract each other. I mean, that's pretty natural from the equation. Something which is more, diff more subtle is that if you have fully decohered superposition, uh, say Schrodinger cats, I mean, they still attract each other. Okay, so that's, that's more puzzling. An important fact is also that because of nonlinearity, the bond rule breaks down. So if you want to interpret the state the wave function as giving you, uh, as psi square as giving you probabilities, you get, you run into inconsistencies. Of course, you can still save the day by prescribing a primitive ontology from which you derive your prescription, but it's more difficult. It, you, you, you can't just use, you can't see a Schrodinger Newton as a simple modification of uh, the Schrodinger equation while keeping the Copenhagen way of extracting uh, the probabilities of outcomes. And of course, I mean, you have a priori to, a possibility to, to signal faster than light. And this was shown by Giza. I say a priori because you can always imagine that you cannot 
that the, the, the states you use to signal, you cannot even prepare them in the theory. But I mean, that, that's, you would have to show that. We can say, I think, safely say that a priori you can signal in Cauchy theory. So making sense of Schrodinger Newton is, is not simple. I mean, you need some kind, probably, of macroscopic collapse. At least a, you have to add a, prim, a clear primitive ontology, maybe a, a preferred frame. And still, it's not an entirely obvious physical theory because you don't have the bound rule. Um, and what I, what I suggest now is, if you look at Schrodinger Newton and say you already have, uh, already have collapsed, what we are, are doing is sourcing space-time curvature from uh, the mass density ontology. So with collapsed models, we have another very natural ontology, which is the flash ontology. People usually don't like the flash ontology because it looks like discrete points, but if you take the CSL model, the flash ontology is actually continuous. It becomes a field of outcomes. So this field of outcomes is as continuous as the matter density. And so instead of putting the matter density here, I put the continuous limit of the flashes. So it's sometimes also called the signal. It's, it's really a, an ontology that's, that's not much used in, in collapsed models. Uh, I mean, I think two days before, Daniel Beddingham gave uh, interesting, an interesting, interesting arguments for this ontology because it's easier to implement symmetries uh, in, in, in such an ontology with respect to the matter density. So I mean, there are other independent arguments for why this is a natural choice and maybe a better choice than the mass density. Okay, if you do that, and then, I mean, of course, you, you crank up the theory, you do your computations, and fortunately, you can write exact equation for matter. So you get an explicit stochastic master equation for matter. You have to be brief on this, but essentially, you, the first two terms are intrinsic decoherence and intrinsic collapse that come from the collapse model you've put in, okay? Nothing new, this is trivial. This is just what I put in my theory first. But the coupling with gravity gives you an additional gravitational decoherence, an additional gravitational noise, and an additional pair potential. The important thing is that if you take the, the, the average of this equation, you get a linear equation. So this equation is, is perfectly fine. As it, I mean, being linear, we can use all we know about, say, orthodox quantum theory. Okay. So I don't, I mean, it, we can stare at it for a long time, but it is probably better to summarize what, what this, this kind of equation gives in practice. So with such a, an equation, you have no faster than like signaling. That's the first thing. The Born rule holds, so you can still essentially use um, the collapse postulate for um, macroscopic observables. You have no one particle self-interaction, and something which is, I find very interesting is that the Gravitational decoherence is inversely proportional to intrinsic decoherence, which means that it makes the lambda parameter of CSL falsifiable from below. So we, we don't have to exclude low lambdas for philosophical reasons or metaphysical reasons. We can exclude small collapse parameters in the, in the theory from physical reasons. Essentially because if the collapse is too weak, that puts a lot of fluctuation in the space-time, in the space -time, which then back reacts and creates tons of fluctuation on matter. So basically, you have a minimum. You can't, that, that, you can't have arbitrary low uh, effect of the collapse. Of course, I mean, I don't want to, I, I think it's important to mention the difficulties you have. Uh, Lyosha has already mentioned that the regularization scale is still very important and really changes the physics. And of course, the relativistic extension is really non-trivial. So you have many, many issues. I won't, I mean, I, I don't have time to talk about them. And, and it's clearly not resolved. And it's probably not just a technical issue. I mean, there are probably deeper, deeper issues. So this is, essentially, this, this program has very nice results in the Newtonian case and in, in the relativistic case so far. I mean, we don't have much. Uh, but, but if you don't want to look at the equations, why does it work so well? I mean, why are all the, in a sense, with this prescription, just going from matter density to flashes or the continuous equivalent, why do you solve all the paradox? Because formally, at the equations level, this is strictly equivalent, like mathematically equivalent to having a detector weakly measuring matter, okay, like, like a, a orthodox detector. 
and then doing feedback on the space-time based on these results. So this is purely at the equations level, we are doing something that can be embedded in purely orthodox theory. And then actually, to do the computation, you just do standard stuff, but it's actually even textbook stuff now. So you, you take this book, Quantum Measurement on, con on Control by Milburn and Wiseman, and, and you have something that at the equation level is, is the same as our model. So formally, and I, I insist this is just a mathematical picture, how this model is equivalent to having detectors everywhere that measure matter, and that, that based on this signal, curve space-time appropriately. Of course, I insist this is just a mathematical picture. This is not, I don't believe there are hidden detectors in the world, okay? I want also to solve the measurement problem. So the reality picture you have to imagine is something like that. Like you have quantum matter that, that essentially gives the probability distribution of this stochastic field. This is the continuous version of the flash. This flash is curved space-time. So you see that my, now my space-time is noisy. And this space-time modifies the dynamic of quantum matter. But by putting this interface, by having quantum matter not directly curve space-time, but first create this primitive ontology, which then curve space-time, we have, a, I mean, we have a consistent picture without faster than likes where we keep the bond rule. So this is really important as it shows that I think it's, there are very few cases I think the first case is making relativistic collapse model, but the second case is this, where being very clear on what is the primitive ontology, what is real in your theory, helps you solve an actual problem, a real problem, not just a philosophical one. So to summary, if you source the gravitational field from the mass density signal instead of the mass density average uh, of a dynamical model, you have a paradox-free theory of Newtonian quantum gravity. Okay, so that doesn't, uh, so if you buy dynamical reduction models for, to, solve the measurement prog to solve the measurement problem, then you get gravity for free. So that's, that's I, I think, quite nice. So I would just, I'm done, thank uh, Lajos, okay, because all, all this work was done with uh, Lajos Joshi, who is here in the audience, who, who talked yesterday. And for two references, I mean, we have one article on this, and recently, uh, Manli Derakshani has written a sort of review of, of the different proposals of quantum gravity in the Newtonian region. So what kind of predictions they make. Okay, so. So, this master equation was written from a modified Schrodinger equation? I, I start, so this is not a, what I wrote was not a master equation, it's really a stochastic master equation. It, it preserves pure states, okay? I could have really written a stochastic Schrodinger. We write it this way because when you take the expectation value, you just have to remove the stochastic term this way. What, what is the stochastic Schrodinger equation like? You have I, So you have all the terms, it's, I wrote it for CSL, but you can start from essentially any collapse, any continuous collapse model, it works. So we did it for, Joshi uh, Penrose and for CSL. As long as they are more Covian, you can do it. So it's, is it just a CSL model with the coupling determined by gravity? It's, There's more to it. No, no, I take CSL model, yes. and then I, from the flash, the, the equivalent of the flashes, that sources gravity. Okay. I take the collapse model as given. I, I hope, I imagine that you, you needed it to solve the measurement problem, and so you, you accepted it, and what I'm telling you is that Basically, the rest, you can, this allows you to eliminate also the gravitational paradox in the Newtonian case. So, so uh, the guy you mentioned in the last reference, Daraksani, so he also was trying to combine collapse and, yeah, yeah. and Newton Schrodinger, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was something else? Or? Yeah, he's, coupling, he's coupling with the, the matter density. So it solves the, mastro, the macroscopic Schrodinger cat problem but you still have the issue of the bond rule and of faster than like signaling. So it's, it's the first step in this direction, but it doesn't solve all the paradoxes. 